Nibben Hall, good, good Abend and uh, welcome to the Cinema of the DFF. I'm Laura Teixeira from the Cinema Department and I'm very happy to be accompanying this uh, lecture series here dedicated to Jia Jian Ke. Um, as you know, this is a cooperation between the DFF, the Deutsche Film Institute and Film Museum, and the Department for Theatre, Film and Media at the Goethe University. And we are also happy to count with the support of the normative orders from the University, the Hessen Film and Media Academy, the Confucius Institute, the Sinologie of the Goethe Universität, the Forschungszentrum Historisches Geisteswissenschaften, and uh, the city of Frankfurt and the Friends of the Goethe University. As you know, we are almost halfway through our service. Um, uh, we are also very happy that to uh, announce that we are um, programming uh, Gia's uh, visit to Frankfurt for February, as you hopefully already know. Um, all the details are in the program, the monthly program of the DFF, which just came out yesterday. As you'll see, Cao Tao is in the cover of the program, which I'm very, very happy about. And she's going to be here as well with uh, Jia Junke on the 16th of February. So you can all write down that date in your calendars if you haven't already. Ready, and tickets are already available at the um, front desk here of the Film Museum or online in our website dff.film. Um, tonight, I'm very extremely happy to welcome Cecilia Melo, who's coming from Brazil for this lecture. Um, and um, Professor Vincent Rediger will now introduce her. Um, I just would like to say, uh, remind you that we, after the lecture, we have this short break. Tonight, we're gonna make it a little bit longer in case anybody still wants to have something to eat at the cafe. They're still gonna have um, sandwiches and cakes there available. So, because this is a longer evening, we're starting earlier, but it's gonna be just as long as usually. So, um, because the film, as you know, is uh, two and a half hours long, and we're gonna still have the Q&A afterwards. I hope many of you can stay to ask questions and talk about your impressions about the lecture, about the film. So, um, I would be happy to see you after the film as well for the Q&A. But first things first, I will now ask Professor Vincent Schrediger to introduce our lecturer of tonight. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you, uh, Laura. One recurring motive of uh, this series uh, has been the observation that uh, Judge Anke resonates very strongly with Brazilians. Um, uh, we have uh, noticed that Laura Teixeira knows his films by heart and uh, participates in our debates and discussions with insights that uh, uh, are always very uh, productive and, and uh, uh, conducive to new insights. Um, Walter Salish, uh, in his own right, one of the key figures of contemporary world cinema, art cinema, a Brazilian director, has dedicated the documentary to um, Zha Zhangke, the guy from Fenyang. Um, and uh, one of the things that you notice when you uh, work on Zha Zhangke as a film scholar is that uh, a, a, a remarkable amount of really great scholarship on contemporary Chinese cinema, but particularly Zha Zhangke, um, comes out of Brazil. And one figure certainly stands out here, and that is our guest tonight, Cecilia uh, Melo. Uh, Cecilia Melo um, obtained her PhD in film studies at uh, Birkbeck College London, which I'm proud to say is a partner university of Frankfurt because we have a joint international master's degree. Um, and uh, she did so under the supervision of none other than uh, Laura Mulvey. And she has been um, a lecturer in film studies in uh, what is per perhaps the premier uh, department of uh, film and cinema studies in Brazil, um, the cinema studies department at the University of Sao Paulo uh, for some time now. Uh, this has just been published. Um, this will be the work of reference on Zha Zhangke for the foreseeable future, the cinema of Zha Zhangke, realism uh, and memory in Chinese film by Cecilia Middle, uh, which was published uh, last year, late last year, with Bloomsbury Academic Publishing and can obviously be obtained via the internet. We're still trying to get some copies for the bookstore upstairs, but so long as you're not here, don't hesitate to buy it online. Um, thank you so much. 
Cecilia, for accepting our invitation and for introducing us to uh, uh, the concluding um, uh, element of the so-called Hometown Trilogy platform, uh, one of the early masterpieces of Jai Junka. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So thank you, Vincent, for this uh, introduction, for the free publicity for my book. And I'd also like to thank Jana Albrecht from the film department of the Institute for Theatre, Film and Media Studies for helping me with logistics. And also to Laura Teixeira uh, from the DFF, very happy to meet you. And um, today I'm going to be talking about the film platform that you will see a bit later on and I'm very happy to be here. So um, I will start my presentation with a short clip, which will you know, hopefully understand why I'm playing it. It's not uh, a Judge and Kerr clip, it's a, an advert for um, a, a clothes apparel brand in China. So I'll just start with this. Oops, sorry. I only represent myself. I am just like you. I am Banco. So the supplement Couture et Idée from Le Monde, published uh, on 29 September 2012, dedicated its cover story to the young Chinese writer, pilot, and now filmmaker, Hang Han, under the suggestive title, Hang Han, China and Me, writer, race pilot, he is the most widely read blogger in the world. He embodies the new Chinese dream, self-fulfillment. The article, motivated by the release of a collection of his texts in French, traced the profile of the writer pilot and described him as the incarnation of youth, independence and success. Han Han, has, uh, Han, Han comes from Shanghai, the city that best uh, symbolizes the growing internationalization of China and its economic expansion in the last three decades. His brief but accelerated trajectory into success has found him a place amongst those interviewed in Jia Zhengke's I Wish I Knew, a documentary composed by testimonies filled with personal memories and impressions that paint a portrait of the city from the 1980s, 1930s sorry, to today. It is also not by chance that Han Han's popularity in China in the new century, as well as his arrays in the world of racing, have turned him into the ideal publicity face for Japanese car brand Subaru, which has long stamped the first page of Han Han's blog uh, with the slogan, I follow my own way, Wo Xin Wo Lu. Individuality and freedom are also behind the campaign for the Chinese um, internet apparel brand Vankol that we just saw, this film that I just showed you. The synthetic image of this video seems to be that of Hang Han holding a banner with the big Chinese character War I stamped on it. Um, I chose to start this lecture with Hang Han because I believe he is an excellent example of a complex phenomenon not so easily defined and that appears in connection with the period of historical, social and economic transition that China has been living through since Deng Xiaoping's era of reforms started in 1978, known in Chinese as Kai Kaifeng. In a country traditionally based on the primacy of collectivity, this phenomenon refers to a growing emphasis on the individual within, uh, within the country's social tapestry 
something that could be described as the emergence of the I or the emergence of a me culture. This can also in part be attributed to the one child policy enforced in China from 1979 onwards and only recently starting to be officially phased out. Jia Zhang Ke was born in 1970, before the start of the one-child policy, but he has lived through the decade that saw the beginnings of this social change, the 1980s. He is therefore, in some ways, as other members of his generation, able to stand in two different positions and to see things from two different perspectives. This privileged position is perhaps one of the defining marks of his cinematographic authorship emerging from a combination of objectivity and subjectivity, of hypermediacy and an original gaze towards reality. One of the main triggers of this individual and authorial voice was, of course, cinema, which first entered Jia Zhengke's life through the video stores of his hometown of Fenyang in Shanxi province, where one could go watch VHS tapes in private booths, as seen, for instance, in parts of his films Xiao Wu and Unknown Pleasures. He remembers watching myriad wuxia films or martial art films, such as uh, Jet Li's first success, Shaolin Temple, uh, and later the films of King Hu and Changsha. One notable, highly influential video store moment for Jia Zhengke was watching the American film Breaking. It's a film from uh, 1984, a musical focusing on the then trendy breakdowns style. This is worth noting as it awakened in him an interest in hip hop culture and uh, in practicing the breakdowns. <laughs> Through this, he ended up landing a slot in a regional tour of a local song and dance troupe. Traveling and spending time with other artists had a definitive impact on the young Jia Zhengke. He became gradually anxious to express himself artistically and developed a desire to be always on the road, it itinerancy being another one of his authorial marks. When back in Fenyang, he enjoyed looking at the cars on the main roads, imagining where they would be going and entertained uh, the idea of becoming a train operator. During the 1980s, therefore, Jia's experiences with films and music from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and from abroad shaped him, as well as his real travels and love for mobility and transport, were gradually shaping him into the cinematic auteur he was to become from the 1990s onwards. The emergence of his authorial voice thus happened during the historical moment between the collective excesses of the Cultural Revolution and the emergence of the I or of a me culture from the 1980s onwards. From this, an important question emerges that emerges relates to the nature of authorship in China and to the use I am making of the concept of the cinematographic auteur. This was, of course, proposed as a politique in the 1960s, uh, in 1950s, sorry, France, by the Young Turks in the pages of Cahiers du Cinéma, and has since then been much debated, de defended or rebuffed. But the notion of auteur I invoke here is closer to the notion of subjectivity, to which Epstein already referred to in the 1920s, and not so much that which gave the politique its shocking appeal at the time, the wish to find the ego or the I in the type of cinema that would seem to annul it, that is, Hollywood cinema. At first glance, the transition to a more individualistic society could lead to the reinforcement or to the very appearance of the concept and the value of the auteur in the Chinese uh, cinema landscape, starting timidly during the fifth generation and more openly with the sixth. The rise of a me culture in China indeed chimes quite well with Truffaut's declaration in The Films of My Life that young filmmakers should express themselves in the first person singular. And with his pun in La Nouvelle Vague 25 ans après, La règle du jeu, in lieu of La règle du jeu, both jeu and jeu in French, I and game sounding the same. 
In this sense, Judge Anker could easily be described as an auteur, writing almost all of his screenplays, working repeatedly with a similar cast and crew, and displaying a very distinctive style and thematic preoccupations that are indissociable from his own personal experiences. Not surprisingly, following the architects of the Politique des Auteurs Truffaut and Godard and their quintessential auteur Hitchcock, Ja has often imprinted his authorial signature in the most material way possible, that is, through cameo appearances. Yet, even if the notion of the auteur is important here, it is not an idea widely relevant to my analysis of Judge Anker's cinema. While a discussion of authorship necessarily entails subjectivity and the expression of the self, it can also oversimplify and contradict what is essentially a collective art form. The importance of collaboration with some key individuals in Judge Anker's career is evident. So calling him an auteur has to necessarily contemplate how whatever authorial marks he displays will still remain a product of the collective voice. Moreover, in a collectivist society such as the Chinese, one should always embrace the notion of authorship with caution. Perhaps it would be wise to suggest, following John Cockey, that authorship is more a practice than a theory, and as a practice it is always essentially collective in the cinema. The other apparent complication to the notion of authorship in the context of my overall analysis of jazz cinema is, of course, the defense I make of the cinema as impure, moved by both a realist and an intermediate and at times hypermediatic impulse. In his early but blunt opposition to literary adaptations, for instance, Truffaut's politics of authorship seemed to also oppose impurity, preferring to search for cinema's specificity away from its promiscuity with other arts. This nowadays seems rather anachronistic. It could be argued that cinema's impure nature is not only largely accepted, but also championed over any preoccupations with purity that might still exist. Moreover, not only does impurity not oppose jazz auteur status, but also it has become one of his most distinguishing authorial marks, with intermediality and hypermediacy being an essential component of his cinematic style. And it is precisely within a world increasingly defined by the logic of hypermediacy, understood here as that which acknowledges multiple acts of representation and makes them visible, that the auteur finds his original voice. So just as hypermediacy does not oppose immediacy, in the same way that realism and intermediality, impurity, are not incompatible, the voice of the auteur does not exist in opposition to all the other voices and artistic regimes around it. Rather, it becomes the space for a democratic encounter with them all. Ultimately, I believe that the realism and impurity, immediacy and hyperimmediacy debate matters insofar as it allows for a more complex reading of Judge Anker's cinema. For while the realist aspects of his uh, work have been studied mainly through a contemporary perspective that privileges its relationship with the effects of globalization in China, a fresh look towards the past and towards varied artistic manifestations can shed new light on important aspects of jazz realist and impure cinema by bringing to the fore the heterogeneity of its aesthetic innovation, one that brings together topicality and historical resonance, innovation and tradition, the present and the past, uh, realism and memory. And now on to Platform. Platform was released in 2000 and it is the second film in Judge Anker's hometown trilogy, preceded by Xiao Wu and followed by Unknown Pleasures. All of these films made without official approval of the Chinese government and still un un not released in mainland China. The film, the last one, he shot on celluloid, and I'm very happy that we're going to be you're going to be screening platform today uh, in 35 millimeter. So this is actually the last film he shot 
on celluloid and the only one in 35 millimeters marks the start of two long-standing and crucial collaborations that make up the core of Jia Ke's creative team, alongside Wang Hongwei and Hong Kongers Yu Li Kui, Chong Kuang and Li Kuit Ming. The first refers to Japanese producer Shozo Ichiyama, who had previously worked with Ho Xiaoxian and who came on to produce Platform in the late 1990s, remaining to this day one of uh, Jia's main producers. The second refers, of course, to Zhao Tao, who was a dance teacher in Taiyuan when Platform began pre-production and who ended up playing uh, one of the main characters in the film, uh, subsequently acting in every one of Zhao Ke's films. The pair married in 2011 and continued to work together. Named after an eponymous 1980s Chinese pop song, Platform follows the lives of four friends who are members of a state performing troupe from the town of Fenyang, that is uh, Jajunka's hometown. The film focuses on the gradual changes affecting the lives of these young artists, evident in the very nature of their performances. Starting as the Fenyang County Rural Cultural Work Team, delivering propaganda plays and songs in praise of Chairman Mao, they end up after privatization as the Shangjiang All Stars Rock and Breakdance Electronic Band, specializing in renditions of pop, pop hits and sassy dance numbers. Jadas chooses to look back and comment on a crucial decade in contemporary Chinese history through a sort of reduction, drawing a parallel between the country's fate and the fate of the troop built from his own recollections of life in Fenyang before he moved to Beijing in the 1990s. Dedicated to the director's father, Platform is not an autobiographical work per se, but it is laden with autobiographical references as Zhao Ke himself acknowledges, and I quote, Platform takes place over the years between 1979 and 1989, a period when the greatest change and reform took place in China. That decade was also very important for my growing up. In China, we have a tendency to connect national fate with individual fortune, politi political condition and human situation. We experienced a great deal in the past 10 years, during which much has been secularized from the loss of revolutionary ideal to the coming of the consumer age. The coming of the consumer age referenced by Jia is directly linked to Deng Xiaoping's implementation from December 1978 onwards of Zhou Enlai's 1960s economic goals known as the Four Modernizations, which marked the beginning of the reform era in China. This happened just over two years after the end of the Cultural Revolution with the downfall of the Gang of Four, and uh, Chairman Mao's death in 1976. In the 1980s, China gradually began to cultivate better relations with the rest of the world and to open its economy to foreign investment. Internally, it reversed the collectivization of ag agriculture, privatized much of the industry and allowed the emergence of private businesses. Coupled with economic reforms, there was a relaxation of certain restrictions, such as the need for official permission for domestic travel, which coincided with a significant expansion of the country's rail network. Since then, China has become increasingly crowded with travelers, crisscrossing the country in search of new opportunities, returning home, going on holidays, an unprecedented phenomenon in the country's modern history. Platform offers a poignant commentary about the beginning of China's economic reforms by articulating the tension between mobility and immobility that permeates the lives of young artists in Shanxi province in the 1980s. In order to do so, the film relies heavily on intermediate connection uh, with architecture to the point of electing as a location the city of Pingao, China's best preserved historical city, now listed by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site for, among others, its impressive 14th century walls, city walls. 
In my book, uh, The Cinema of Judge and Kerr, I have written on the film's relationship with architecture and analyzed the walls of Pinhao as a metaphorical configuration integral to the film's style and narrative structure, paralleling with it with Spring in a Small Town, famous 1949 classic, which also features walls and lost loves. Today, however, I chose to focus uh, on Platform's combination of realism and impurity with a special emphasis on its use of pop music. Generally speaking, jazz cinema relies heavily on other media, including television broadcasts, extracts from other films, mobile phone, computer and tablet screens, karaoke pop videos, radio broadcasts and pop music, interwoven into the narrative of his films with varied effects, although never with the intention of distracting from the real. These are, in fact, in tandem with the growing experience of hypermediacy in our day and can also be understood as an integral part of jazz experience of growing up in China in the 1980s, when gradually mediation and remediation found their way into people's homes and lives. The memory of the 1980s and the experience of contemporaneity, therefore, are markedly hypermediatic, and this characteristic of the real is impregnated in the form and content of his oeuvre. In platform, Jia attests to his affiliation to the cinema of Ho Xiaoxian, who frequently employed radio broadcasts in his films in order to situate them historically by including radio or loudspeaker broadcasts announcing the posthumous rehabilitation of Liu Xiaoqi uh, at some point, as you will see in the film, and uh, the 35th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China, which happened in 1980 and 1984, respectively. And towards the end of the film, you'll see the character Tui Ming Liang's mother uh, watching an early episode of the very popular Chinese soap opera Kawang, uh, Yearnings, thus leaving no doubt that the time of the action is 1990. Hypermediacy also manifests itself intertextually in platform, quite often the expression of the director's cinephilia. Early on in the film, the group of friends is seen in a cinema watching the 1951 Indian comedy musical Awara by Raj Kapoor, who plays the Chaplinesque vagabond in what was said to be Chairman Mao's favorite film. The extract shown is that of Kapoor singing a hugely popular song, Awara Hun, I Am a Vagabond. The film had been re-released in China in the late 1970s, during the first years of reform. It became hugely popular with many people, including Jia Zhengke and his friends in Fenyang, still able to sing this song today. Another film that is mentioned through music in platform is Little Flower, Xiao Hua from 1979, whose opening tune can be heard over a striking establishing shot of the town's main square and film theatre, where friends gather in bicycles and on foot in an image vaguely reminiscent of Hendrik Overkamp's winter landscape with ice skaters. Little Flower, the film, reappears more prominently in 24 City, being watched on a television screen and with the presence of none other than Joan Chen, who had starred and began her career with this propaganda film. Within this hyper-mediated world, the medium of pop music can be said to occupy pride of, pride of place, becoming within jazz cinema more than incidental or integrated occurrences and thus rising to the status of intermedial gestures. One reason for this, as hinted before, is the fact that Jia Junker came of age in the 1980s, when popular music began to take root in China. The centrality of pop music to his cinema is often explicit in his choice of film titles, both in Chinese and in English. The prime example of this would be the film Unknown Pleasures, which is the title of Joy Division's first record and whose original Chinese title, Ren Xiaoyao, comes from a song by Taiwanese singer Richie Jen. 
platform, the film, is also the name of a popular uh, song from 1980s in China, as I will explain a bit later. While the desire to capture the spirit of a certain era and to activate memory can explain Jajanka's use of pop music, it is also important to consider what are the medium specific qualities of, pop, of a pop song and how do they engage into an intermediate relationship with film. Music and film are of course intertwined and pop music has been employed very often by the cinema. But to speak of intermediality requires the observation of at least two different phenomena. One refers to the lyrical, verbal, vocal quality of pop music, directly related also to its presentness. Generally speaking, a pop song creates its own narrative. It tells a story, and this quality evidences its roots uh, in the English and American traditions of folk, poetry and music. Therefore, when pop music is employed emphatically in a film, inevitably its musical narrative will become integrated into the film's narrative, which means that the emotions, the desires, intentions and references, as well as the historical context, in short, everything springing from the lyrical subject, will impose itself over the film's own narrative. This combination will necessarily lead to a certain effect, be it complementary, dialectic, ironic, but never uh, uh, unsignificant. The second phenomena related to the intermediate use of pop music in film refers to the pop video quality of this insertion. That is, to how the musical rhythm, as well as its lyrics and the melodic qualities, will affect the editing and the meaning of the images and sounds on the screen. So both strands, the memorial, historical and the aesthetic narrative, explain why pop music in the cinema, and specifically in Judge and Kerr's cinema, can be described as a privileged form of intermediality. As I will suggest, uh, this crystallizes in a particularly poignant form in the film platform, where pop music is employed as a historical, memorial, narrative and aesthetic tool, able to create different journeys and passages across geographies, moving between the individual and the collective and within oneself. Platform, the film, unlike the rest of Jajanka's work, is entirely situated in the past time, between 1979 and 1990, and casts a retrospective look at this crucial decade of the country's recent history by articulating a number of references into textual and intermedial. This results in a hypermediatic filmic universe relating to both the director's memories and to those of his generation in a form of collective memory. At the center of this network of references are the various pop songs that punctuate the film, configuring something more than a series of incidental insertions. If memory appears as one of the main impulses behind platform, the numbers related to the film indicate how Jajanka embarked on this project uh, unhurried. The first cut of the film was over four hours, shortened to a two and a half uh, hour in the final version. Platform is still the director's longest film and had the longest production time, the shoot spanning more than a year to cover the four seasons. Finally, the dominant style of the film structured upon a Bazinian aesthetic realism of the 35 mm long take strengthens the impression of an inherent fidelity to duration. At the same time, this chronological, neurological, uh, meteorological and phenomenological preoccupation with the passage or perception of time seems to be constantly challenged in platform through the refusal of a linear or systemic development. The film, <coughs> which relies on frequent temporal ellipses, resists the temptation to explain each event and instead embraces the fractures, <coughs> sorry, the pieces that do not fit together, the details, <coughs> 
Thus the narrative contains loose ends, unexplained events, others mentioned but not really shown, a feature analogous to the unstable nature of memory. This anti-systemic impulse that permeates the film must also be seen as a political gesture. For if the relaxation of cause and effect relationships appeared in Italian neorealism mainly as a counterpoint to the coherence and linear narrative of classical Hollywood cinema, thus marking a moment of fundamental inflection in the history of cinema, in platform, a fluid narrative appears in opposition not only to classical narrative, but also to what could be described as the great communist narrative. This is because the memory enunciated in the first person of the auteur ine inevitably complicates the official narrative promoted by the regime in an attempt to rewrite China's history from the year zero of 1949. Sorry. Erasing the past and promoting a progress-driven timeline. With the emergence of mass consumption culture and the process of globalization, this classical narrative is now disturbed by a higher notion uh, of the existence of other spaces and other uh, temporalities, producing a new experience of time related to daily life and the contingent and gradually causing a concussion and a fracture in the national narrative. The issue of memory and time so central to platform finds its main vehicle in pop music and this can be observed sharply in three sequences where the director presents complex mnemonic journeys central to his characters' lives. As I will suggest in the three sequences in question that you will soon see, the songs are conveyed through a crucial shifting positionality, that is, from the diegetic source, a cassette player, a radio, a car stereo, to the extra diegetic, playing over the landscape or the city streets with no identifiable source. The use of the diegetic and non-diegetic music works in the film as an aesthetic translation of the bridge between the individual and collective memory. And thus pop music gains an even deeper significance in platform through the editing. The film, as mentioned before, follows a group of artists who tour the region, putting up song and dance shows. If at first this seems to suggest freedom and a forward movement, it nevertheless paradoxically exacerbates an enormous sense of isolation. The artist, instead of being on the road, uh, with a certain destination, seem to actually move in circles, traversing very uh, em empty spaces, punctuated here and there by small villages, distant from the great cities and from the coast, which fi finally all these roads seem to take them back always to Fenyang. The audacious uh, character Zhang Jun is the first to break this isolation by visiting his aunts in distant Guangzhou, located in the southeast of the country, just north of Hong Kong. From there, he sends a postcard to his friend, Tui Ming Liang, in which a photo of Guangzhou comes accompanied by the suggestive message proclaiming, the world outside is incredible. Later, Zhang Jun returns to Fenyang, dressed in fashionable clothes and carrying a tape recorder, with the new hits from Taiwan and Hong Kong brought from the big city. It is worth remembering that places like Guangzhou, uh, as well as Hong Kong and Taiwan, and the four special economic zones, Shenzhen, Zhuhai, Shantou, and Xiamen, set up in the early 1980s in Southeast China on the Pearl River Delta to attract foreign investment and technology, functioned as an open door to the world. It is therefore significant that after privatization, the traveling group of artists decide to rename themselves as the Shenzhen All Stars, lending the name of the largest of these special economic zones as a symbol of the novelty and the freshness of the maritime air that is so far from Fenyang and Shanxi where they live. 
The return of this character, Zhang Jun, to Fenyang functions as a first indication of the wave of transformations that would affect the lives of the young artists of the province. His orange blouse, sunglasses and flares make him stand out from his friends, whose garments still very, um, sorry, still very little from the ubiquitous Mao jackets of the 1960s and 70s. Even more important is the presence of the cassette recorder, a device that became extremely popular during the 1980s and that is characterized by a personal and introverted mode of listening. This feature becomes even more evident in counterpoint to the blatant use of loudspeakers in Chinese cities at least until the 1980s. Present in the streets, factories, dormitories and other public spaces, the speakers serve to broadcast everything. <coughs> from official announcements from the Central People's Broadcasting Station to propaganda songs <coughs> extolling the wonders of Communist China and the Radio Calisthenic series. This mode of public listening provided by the loudspeaker, imposed on the population as a voice coming from a superior instance, finds in the cassette player its antithesis. The portability of the device and its ability to tune the radio and play tapes thus meant a freedom of choice, a personal and intimate listening that contrasted with the public and official imposition of the collective voice. So, arriving in Fenyang full of news, Zhang Jun is greeted by his friend Ming Liang, who jokingly points a shotgun at him and shouts, you foreign devil. Soon, other colleagues surround him, barely containing the myriad questions about the trip and about the world out there. The cassette player draws special attention and finally someone presses play, giving rise to the diegetic use of a song brought by Zhang Jin directly from Guangzhou. This song is Genghis Khan, the Cantonese version by popular Hong Kong singer George Lam for the song Genghis Khan by the German group of the same name, which competed in the Eurovision Song Contest of 1979. And incidentally, there is also a Brazilian version of this song <laughs> around the same time. <clears throat> so this strange disco era uh, song coming from Hong Kong via Germany to mainland China permeates the next two scenes. In the first, you'll see the friends dancing to this tune, and then there's another scene where the song continues to be heard extra diegetically while the group fix shards of glass to protect a wall of a house. There is no doubt that Jajanka chose this song by George Lam, aware of the implications of this title, Genghis Khan. For he is, after all, the dreaded 13th century Mongol emperor, seen by many today still in China, <coughs> as a barbarian invader. <clears throat> Therefore, when arriving at Fenyang, this time coming from the south in the tapes of Zhang Jun and in the voice of George Lam, Genghis Khan is at the same time the novelty that begins to infiltrate the isolated universe of the town and also <coughs> an ironic comment since... <clears throat> It is the song that will fuel the dance of the young friends for the promise of freer days. For it was, of course, Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan grandson Kublai Khan who supplanted the walls that the Chinese empire built for centuries to preserve its isolation. <clears throat> the trope of bricks and fortified walls appears in conjunction with the song that refers not by chance to the Khans who transposed these walls, just as China begins to open its borders to the rest of the world. Jajanka thus weaves a sophisticated commentary on the desire for individual freedom that emerges with the gradual violation of the economic and cultural walls of his, of his country in the 1980s. <clears throat> If Genghis Khan is exemplary of what can be called an outbound journey, coming to Fenyang from Guangzhou, the south, 
and referring to a foreign invader. The Taiwanese pop songs of Teresa Dung and Julie Su suggest the possibility of another type of journey um, that I will call an inward journey. It is known that the exposure to romantic songs in mainland China after the end of the Cultural Revolution, especially those of Taiwan, had a great impact in the country because they represented a novelty of style in relation to the communist propaganda songs. They, these songs came mainly through radio broadcasts whose sound waves supplanted the distance between China and the renegade province of Taiwan. So popular was Theresa Tang in the 80s that a phrase was coined, and it says something like, Pai Dian <coughs> Ting Lao Tang, <coughs> Wang Shang Ting Xiao Tang. Deng Xiaoping by day, Theresa Tang by night. <laughs> they have the same surname in Chinese. Uh, there are several moments in platform when the young artists listen to Taiwanese uh, uh, music broadcasting, uh, Taiwanese radio shows broadcasting hits by Teresa Tang, such as, for instance, Meijo Jia Cafe or Good Wine and Coffee, very foreign things. In addition to representing this important cross-sea connection between the two Chinas and the attractions of the outside world, the immense popularity of these songs was due to their innovative use of the first-person enunciation with the personal pronoun I uh, replacing we. As Jajanka recalls, and I quote, when I was a child, we used to always sing, we carry on communism, or we are the new generation of the 1980s, both of which highlighted we, the collective. But Theresa Tang's songs were always about me, the individual. Songs like I Love You or The Moon Represents My Heart were something completely new. So people of my generation were certainly infected with this very personal, individual world. <clears throat> This change in the musical world or mental landscape of the Chinese youth in the 1980s appears in a remarkable sequence that you will soon see, in which the character uh, played by Zhao Tao in Rei Juan listens to a romantic song by Taiwanese singer Julie Su called Shifal. Or is it, is it true? Rei Juan had left the theatre group after privatisation, preferring to settle in the town of Fenyang as a tax collector for the city hall. In this sequence, uh, made up of three shots, she's first seen alone in her office, listening to the radio. After a brief announcement, <clears throat> it begins to play the song, and then she starts to rehearse dance movements, eventually letting herself be carried away by the music and indulging in a dance. This is shown in a long take with no cuts of over just three minutes, followed by the song then being played extra diegetically over a dolly out shot of Rajan driving her moped, and finally over a dolly in shot of a lorry driving away with Choi Ming Liang sitting alone in the back. The sequence is choreographed and moves between different points of view, giving room for the character's individuality to emerge through her dance and uniting the star-crossed lovers in these two shots that bridge the diegetic and non-diegetic sound. Ultimately, it encapsulates through cinema's intermediate use of pop music the tension between the mobility and immobility, freedom and repression, the coast and the interior, old and new, and ultimately the we of communism and the I of new China. The voice of Julie Su sings about heartbreak. She says something like, will I really leave you this time? Will I stop crying this time? How long do I have to struggle with loneliness and suppress the tears in my chest? <clears throat> and this song comes from a portable radio, not a loudspeaker. More so than Genghis Khan, Shifo appears as opposed to songs like Tamen Gongren Yo Li Liang, or The Workers Have Strength which plays over the loudspeakers in the scene early on in the film that you'll see, where Tui Ming Liang and John Jun try on their new flares, very impractical trousers to work in, as uh, Tui Ming Liang's father points out. It would thus be fair to say that the presence of pop music gives rise not only to the emergence of new temporalities through an outbound journey, as in the case of the previous sequence, 
but also to the emergence of new subjectivities through an inbound journey. In this unique and memorable sequence, four eyes emerge, the eye of the song of uh, Jili Su, the eye of the character Wei Zhen, the eye of Tui Ming Liang, and finally the eye of the auteur Jia Zhengke. The final sequence I wish to bring to this analysis, rather than journeying outbound or inbound, stays on the platform waiting. It revolves around the 1980s Chinese hit platform, Zheng Tai, the song after which the film is titled. Sung by Liu Hong, Platform was one of the first pop hits in mainland China, included in the album Crazy 87, regarded as a landmark in the country's uh, opening to the influences of foreign culture. The lyrics of the song speak of a long and lonely wait. They say something like the long platform and endless waiting on the platform. My heart waits, always waiting. In Platform, the film, the song appears when the members of the privatized Shenzhen All Stars troupe see a train for the first time in a secluded and deserted region. Ming Liang is sitting alone inside his lorry and places a cassette in the stereo. He's wearing a pair of goggles and discreetly shakes his head to the tune of Platform, but is soon interrupted by shouts of train, train, from his colleagues. <coughs> they all run off towards a long bridge that crosses the ravine, climbing up in the hopes of catching sight of the train, with the song now playing extra diegetically over the long shots of the landscape. Finally, they reach the top as the train has finished crossing the bridge. They shout and wave at this sudden novelty. Train travel in China was indeed a great novelty in the 1980s, a country that came late to uh, railroading. In fact, the earliest lines to be built had uh, failed to impress the Qing government in the 19th century and were completely destroyed. Always suspicious of all things foreign and technology, it was not until the end of the 19th century that the government began granting concessions to European powers and to the USA to lay railroads inland. When China was declared a republic in 1911 by Sun Yat-sen, he envisioned railroad expansion, but due to increasing unrest, conflict and later the war, this was not achieved. After the Communist Revolution in 1949, railroading became once again a priority and the PRC invested quite heavily in its construction. Yet it was not until the 1980s that the lines began to be modernized and that train travel really uh, became a common practice in the country. In platform, the appearance of the train brings with it a whiff of freedom, speed and change to the friends from Fenyang. This is a passage that evokes the classic sequence in Sojet Rai's masterpiece Pater Panchali from 1955, where Apu and his sister Durga run across a field to catch a glimpse of a train. The recurrent trope of the train in both films unites India and China in their common experience of modernity. And it is a felicitous reminder of cinema's ability to converge towards a collective unconscious. In that sense, the train also echoes the first cinema of the Lumiere brothers, who in 1896 capture the paradigmatic image of movement, that is, of a train coming towards the camera, positioned on a platform. The affinity between the cinema and the train extends, therefore, to their modern origins, both appearing in the 19th century and being loaded and, uh, with symbolic connotations that make them synonymous with modernity. Giuliana Bruno creates an analogy between the movie screen and the train window based on their rectangular shape, with frames, uh, which frames a moving image placed before a body that is mobile and motionless. The image of the train in motion is then, in, my, in, the, in the final, final analysis, an instance of the ephemeral, of that which passes but does not remain, of fleeting time and the abs absence of certainties, also typical of the modern experience. 
platform corroborates these affinities between the train and the cinema through multiple references to, to trains that appear from its first shot. So you need to pay attention uh, for the first shot of the film, which is a black screen accompanied only by the sound of the train whistle. Then, standing on a dark stage, Ing Reidran announces the presentation of the 1970s propaganda piece Train to Shaoshan. But if at the beginning the train seemed to have a fixed destination, Shaoshan, the hometown of the great leader Mao Zedong, and a clearly revolutionary and propagandistic project, already in the second half of the 1980s, it seems to follow the unknown, the unexpected, passing so quickly it barely leaves traces. In the sequence in question, the camera is placed on the platform and observes the group of friends that gradually arrives on the bridge, some still shouting and waving, others already out of breath. The music, muffled by the noise of the train, ends up giving way to the silence of waiting. No longer the homogeneous time of the nation, no longer the certainty of departure or arrival, only the expectation and the fluidity of memory. But it was from memory that Jajanka was able to evoke and produce what I believe to be the synthetic image of the film, of the hometown trilogy, and perhaps of all the Chinese cinema of the sixth generation. Off the train, a train towards Shaoshan, towards progress, towards the future, who knows. Standing on a long platform, the start and the end of a journey, Tui Mingliang, Zhang Jun, Zhang Ping and their colleagues are waiting, aware that the transformations that have come to reshape their country do not necessarily entail the promise for three days. Thank you very much. Tsai Jian <laughs> from Jajanka, and thank you. And uh, I hope you enjoy Platform. It's an incredible film, and I, I will be here to discuss it with you after the screening. Thank you, Shen. Well, I first want to thank you again for providing us such a, a wonderful roadmap to mm -hmm. uh, what is actually a very complex film. It's a film that spans a period, as you uh, uh, reminded us, spans a period of 10 years. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fragmentary chronicle of you know, the big transformation that happens in the decade after the Cultural Revolution. Um, <clears throat> and you um, mapped it for us through the songs, to put it a bit reductively, through songs and screens, um, uh, the pop songs that, interestingly, as you pointed out in the talk, usually ha start out with the diegetic source and then move to the non-diegetic realm, so they, they become sort of dislocated. Uh, so they, they transcend the, the original location of, of the action um, and contribute to the construction of a sort of a, a historical experience continuum that is very, very multi-layered. And in a similar fashion, as you <clears throat> showed us uh, in discussing the various film segments, the, the Raj Kapoor film, um, the the Chinese soap opera from the 1990s, uh, films and television programs have a, have a way of transcending the situation in which people live. So they're sort of windows to another world, to a better world, aspirational devices, if you will, um, <clears throat> and and they're absolutely instrumental in in uh, you know constructing. The, the world of the film and, and the complex historical narrative um, that, that the film offers. Um, there are two elements that I was thinking about in addition to screens and songs as I was watching or re-watching the film. Um, one is color and the other are material objects, particularly cigarettes. Uh, 
there's a lot of smoking in this film, <laughs> and uh, it's it's quite significant what they smoke and when they smoke and and how. And there's in a way a trajectory from the smoking early in the film to one of the last scenes where the Shao Tao character offers a cigarette to her suitor or the man she's really interested in and which she ends forming a family with in the end. And it's clearly a Western-style brand cigarette that she's offering him. So she pulls out the packet. And and there's a huge difference between the kind of cigarette they smoke in the beginning of the film and that Western-style packet package in the early 90s. So one of the things that struck me, and um, I wonder whether you can comment on this, is how carefully the story and the history that the film covers and the story that the film tells is told through these material objects, including cars. You know, in the end, in the street, you have these Volkswagen cars, which clearly are nowhere to be seen in the in the in the early parts of the film but at the time of shooting were all over the place so um it's it's very carefully calibrated in terms of material objects and then maybe we can talk about color later but uh what about the material objects or do you have something to say about them yeah i mean that's um that's an excellent uh, observation i think and of course platform is a multi-layered complicated film and we could uh, talk about different aspects of the film and write different papers about single aspects of the film and one we is do, we could do a whole conference yes the single exactly film and so cigarettes uh, definitely uh, they play a major part not only in this film but in all of judge and cinema and um, as you probably know in china if you hand out a cigarette to someone it's a sign of friendship mm-hmm. And it's something that happens quite often. I mean, um, when I was in China and I used to smoke, I used to be, you know, to be in this situation where people would come in and hand me a cigarette. And I know it's a sign of friendship and it happens a lot in Jajanka mm. cinema. Um, in uh, Still Life, for instance, there's a whole segment called cigarettes. So mm. it's cigarettes, liquor, candy, you know, these objects, everyday objects that are presents that you give to people. Um, so there's that. And of course, there is the uh, sort of the changing of the cigarette, as you noticed. Mm-hmm. And if you remember in Xiaowu, there is this whole um, sequence around Marlboro, mm-hmm. which is like a different, a new brand as an American cigarette that's right, just yeah. come and they're looking at it and it's like, what is this? Oh, it's American. And yeah. And obviously, probably, I don't know, but those are fake Marlboros, as you know, they're used, they're used to smoke in, in, in China, quite a lot of fake foreign cigarettes. So. Like like there is fake fashion. Yes, exactly. But uh, yes, of course, I mean, the whole the film has all these um, markers of time and objects that tell uh, the passing of the time and the opening up. And I focus on the cassette recorder, which is one. Um, uh, and the clothes and, you know, and of course then the colors, if you want to d- talk about the, the colors as well, we can sort of... I was, I was just reminded, one of the things that Dudley Andrew talked about when he was here and, and introduced uh, the world is <clears throat> he talked about the color green mm, on the yeah. walls. Yeah. And, and he said that at one point when he interviewed uh, Joe, he just asked a question about the color green and that started like a long yeah, yeah, explanation yeah. and and it became clear that that particular color was really important to him because it it stood for the kind of china where he grew in which he grew up yeah yeah, yeah. i mean that's uh, he's talked a lot about this judge and Kerr, about the green and he he's uh, even told the story that when he, when he was little, he used to run around the house quite a lot, and and the houses were painted half green, in 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 a way to try and um, uh, uh, sort of imitate a little bit the institutional buildings. So hospitals and factories are all painted half green, mm-hmm. and then the house people would paint their houses half green, also, like schools. Yeah, so he would be bumping in the walls, and so he remembers the green from even from very, being very little and looking at it. And then, of course, green is very important in the cinema, and we we know that from you know different films. And here you do have 
the green and the blue, but there's also the color of the Mao jackets, that, yeah, and gray, green, blue, that sort of tonality. Mm. And then, of course, opening up means the color coming into this life. So you have the orange and then the red yeah. with the Spanish dancer and uh, the, the sort of bright, uh, bright colors that you, yeah. you see coming into these worlds. Um, um, yeah, and in this this region in the, in, in in Shanxi, and they travel all the way up to Inner Mongolia. Mm. So that's when you see the river. That's the Yellow River that you see there, yeah. and with those mountains, and that's sort of high um, up up north in China. And so the 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 whole area of the Yellow River, the Yellow Earth, mm. is also sort of a, has a tonality that is very important to the film. Uh, and um, pastel, sort of, yeah, but not really bright. But then the the new the new things coming into this world are colorful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the it's a very painterly film. Uh, and, very painterly, and, yeah. And and you you know it, it seems like a random documentary aesthetic, but then every shot is so thoroughly composed yeah, and yeah. so carefully calibrated in terms of color and composition. And that's that's obviously, I mean, something that runs through his work that you always have this tension between a, you know, casual what looks like a casual documentary aesthetic, but it's super composed and controlled, and there's a lot of artistry yeah. uh, in it, and so that tension is really fascinating to me. Yeah. I think in my book, what I tried to to write about when I was uh, analyzing Judge Anka's work was exactly this combination of realism and impurity or intermediality. And I locate uh, the relationship of his cinema with other arts uh, in a sort of um, a, a gesture of bringing history into contemporary China or bringing other artistic manifestations into cinema. So, for instance, the tracking shots that he uh, sort of ex executes in this film, but in many other films, and especially in still life, that you see a lot of these lateral tracking shots. That's a painterly move. That's sort of uh, uh, similar to the scrolling, you know, of a scroll paint. So that is very much so um, an intermediate gesture of his cinema. And you have that with architecture as well, which I think is very poignant and very important. You have the city of Pingao. This film is shot in the city of Pingao, but it's uh, not named. I mean, the city that he names is Fenyang. Fenyang is his town, hometown. It is um, an interesting place, but not nearly as interesting as Pingao. Pingao is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and uh, he shot there for a reason, because of these walls, but he doesn't really name the, the place in the film. I mean, if you watch it, you, won't, you wouldn't know it was uh, Pingao if you hadn't been there, if you didn't know about it. So he, this realism is sort of um, complicated by things like that, like gestures like that. He wants to shoot in a place where you have historical walls because that is the past and it's always present in the present in China you know so there's all these layers of temporality that for me are really important in the cinema with architecture with paint, uh, painting with opera in a touch of sin um, and um, especially with the um, there's opera elements here too. I mean, there's a bit, a little bit of it. There's there's sort of all this uh, tradition of performing performance is uh, yeah, uh, but touch a touch of sin. It, it's an open sort of reference to to operas that he weaves mm. in the film, and uh, and especially the world for me is, a, is an important film because most people see it through contemporary eyes. So globalization opening up. And my reading of the world is a bit different, is um, based on Chinese uh, garden architecture. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to analyze how the World Park is in fact not a sign of globalization, but a historical um, sort of um, a tradition in China mm -hmm. to bring the world to China rather exactly. than go out and yeah. see the world. So I compare that with uh, Imperial Gardens yeah. uh, that also try to represent or bring other landscapes to Beijing. Mm. Uh, so this is something that the Chinese have been doing for a long, long yeah, time. Yeah. So I think Jia is very aware of uh, 
the tradition that he's uh, dialoguing with. Exactly. And he is, um, in that sense, uh, a filmmaker that wants to preserve things. So he's interested in preserving something that is changing very quickly and he's mourning that and feeling for it. And, um, and that's why it's important for him to bring in the past. But that, yeah, that's just a little bit of how I see it. And I think I see that in platform through Ping Out and also through the pop music that was important for him then. But if you speak to Zhao Tao, she will say, no, I didn't listen to those songs. I mean, she's a bit younger than him and she yeah. doesn't really know those songs. So yeah. uh, already that's passed into something else. So, yeah, he's mm. preserving something in his films, mm. his memory, his co a collective memory as well. I mean, one one point in moment, and we'll open to the audience in a second, uh, is when they sing Bella Chao in Chinese. Yeah, um, yeah. Sit, sit on the truck, and that's clearly sort of a harken back to to the fifties and sixties and the the revolutionary yeah. moment, and and that's very strong. And just just a, a one last remark about the cigarette issue, since you. Um, alerted us to the fact that exchanging cigarettes is a, is a gesture of friendship. There's the heartbreaking sort of indirect breakup scene with the woman who didn't, didn't want to have an abortion and then tells the other boy to tell her suitor to get lost. And the, the way he shows it is that, that the, the guy he tells us, she tells it to is playing with a lighter, but he doesn't have a cigarette. So he's he's fooling around with the lighter, and she tells him to tell him to get lost. So mm -hmm. it, once again, the story is told by uh, cigarettes only in the absence of the cigarette. Yeah. Yeah. So do we have questions from the audience or comments, readings? <laughs> yes, Danny, please. Um. Just wanted to. I don't know if this was just my uh, perspective, but I felt that there was a real like, the, like the trajectory of the film was really one of presenting this kind of loss of innocence and kind of like it was imbued with a nostalgia for the early scenes and uh, that that period is almost. I mean, it's almost presented in this kind of idyllic light uh, in comparison to the kind of like, uh, I guess, progressive crassness uh of the of the of the later parts of the film uh and of course uh china itself was not like necessarily idyllic at that time in the late 1970s it was a very tumultuous period is it death of Mao, and the gang of four trials the rise of Deng Xiaoping? i mean it was like a lot of uh uh kind of tumult going uh or taking place in the country but there's a sense in the film uh I don't know if you feel like, or this is a question I want to post to you, I guess. Do you, did you feel a sense of kind of nostalgia and a sense of loss of innocence and a sense of kind of almost yearning for that past present in the, present in the film? Well, um, I think Jojenko is a complex filmmaker always, so it's very difficult to say he is nostalgic for that period or he isn't. There's an ambivalence that runs through his cinema in every single way, every single sort of um, different different way, really, I think. So I think there is an, a certain nostalgia for it when he was young and he was, you know, sort of growing up and there was some sort of, there was some sort of certainty. There was, there was um, uh, something you could believe in. And, um, but at the same time, you have the parents that are repressive towards the the, the, ch the kids and um, a yearning for freedom and for artistic expression. So I think it's ambivalent, you know. I think, of course, there is a little bit of a nostalgia, but it's not just simply a nostalgia. Um, of course, it becomes, um, with the breakdowns, Shenzhen, whatever group, um, it is crass, as you said, and, um, and and they seem lost, and they seem like not knowing where to go, or um, they seem a bit like, um, well, on the platform, as I try to, to suggest. So I think um, this enhances this impression of an idealized past, which is not really idealized. Uh, it's just a, maybe a 
a moment when they could be certain of certain uh, could could have um, could be sure of things, or they had, had something to believe in that was sort of given to them. And there is something that will give you that security. And then when you privatize, then you don't have the state anymore. You don't have the government anymore taking care of you. And who's going to look after you? So I think there is that, you know, in the film. The film it shows that. But it, it, but it is ambivalent. I mean, of course, he um, went through a very difficult period when he was a child and beginning of the 80s. So, and his family as well was persecuted and, and he, he was hungry most of the time. So obviously, um, this is the film, but uh, you know, his reality is a lot harsher than, than this. Yeah, that's just one little thing I wanted to follow up with because also he would be about a decade younger than the characters yeah. in this film. So maybe also... He was nine years people. old when the story that he tells starts. starts. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask about like that, I guess, generational gap between Ja Chanka himself and the, the characters in the film. And this is almost like the... like. Uh, him looking up to a kind of older sibling or something, you know. Yeah, his sister was part of a song and dance troupe, so he and his sister was uh, an inspiration for him. So in the beginning, she was sort of um, the first part of the film, but he joined a song and dance troupe in the mid '80s. So he was sort of the second part, you know, in the the break dancing thing that he used to break dance and so yeah it was the sister and then him i think the film has these two moments um yeah if, if i may add a little thing i was actually uh, th as i was watching the film thinking about the fact that he was nine years old when the story that he tells started which automatically makes him a historian rather than an autobiographer if you will so it's a story that he's it's a world that he's intimately familiar with but it's not his story. So he could be his it, it, it is and historian it is. to a certain extent, but yeah. it's not his personal story. It is, I mean, I would say it is yeah. with the, the Shenzhen breakdowns because yeah. he was, that's what he experienced. Right. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, part of it is his story. Mm -hmm. Part of it is his sister's story. Yeah. Um, and we can think maybe these, these young artists are 16 or something. So they're, yeah, so it's sort of, I don't know maybe seven, eight years older than him, maybe not so much older than him, you know. So there is there is a little bit of everything that in, in, I think, personal memory and the family memory and a collective memory from a generation that he sort of took what, well, yeah, is his generation. But just in terms of the, of the story of privatization and the state, I think that the final shot is obviously very significant because the Shao Tao San character who breaks up with the artist earlier in the film because her father, who is a functionary and represents the state and the government, doesn't want her to hang out with these art people, um, she becomes a tax collector, so a government functionary. And the final shot, we, we have a, a you know the nuclear family, but the artist is sound asleep on the couch with a cigarette in hand, by the way. And she's cooking and taking care of the kids, and she's clearly in control. And uh, I was wondering what you think the meaning of that last shot is as against the history of the transformation of China and the relationship between the state and the whole privatization issue. What does the Zhao Tao character stand for in that final shot? Well, we could sort of uh, try and um, um, speculate on this, but I, I mean, uh, the fact that he's asleep obviously is um, a failure of that dream to. Being, being an artist or, or be doing something different or, you know, sort of breaking f away from that environment uh, is. So it's a complete failure. He's asleep there. You see the wall in from outside the window. So she's in, in her father's uh, apartment house where we saw her before. So we see the wall. So they're still sort of inside those walls. They haven't really you know, uh, traveled beyond that. I mean, they tried t 
to go away and then came back to that same place. And she's a bureaucrat and uh, I don't see her so much as in control. I mean, she's the mom and she's, you know, she, taking care of the kids. Yeah. But I see, I, I see her playing the role that she's supposed to play, having a kid. And uh, I see the frustration of, um, of, of a dream, a, you know, that never really came true. But she's happy. Well, I think she's happy playing the role that she's supposed to play, uh, of okay. having a kid. Um, but the scene where she dances for me is still that, you know, sort of artist inside of her that sometimes will still come out, and but most of the time will not because she she has to play that yeah. role and that's her life. But she's a dancer. There's something deeper in her that she had to give up, uh, and. It isn't unhappiness for like complete and unhappy like a, like a, in a Western style. I'm frustrated because I couldn't follow my dreams. That I don't think that translates well into the Chinese mm. uh, society. Not it, even today, it doesn't translate so well. I mean, even even after the the rise of the me culture and the, uh, I think, of course, things have changed a lot. But there's still that idea of you being a part of something bigger and mm. you having to play a role in your society, and so. I wouldn't say happy, but I would just say she's doing what she's supposed to be doing and, you know, the whole thing, you know, he's asleep because... But she also married. Past, yeah. She also started a family with the guy she was not supposed to be together with. Yeah, yeah, because... So yeah. She, 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 she both fulfills, you know, her father's expectations and gets what she wants. And it's, I mean, I'm not saying she's like fully happy and it's great and we can talk about whether or not she, there's an artist bird inside of her and what it means that the artist is asleep on the couch. But it's it's sort of one of those, it, it reminds me of those ambiguous happy endings in, in von Sternberg or Douglas Sirk. Or, you <laughs> You're know. thinking of all the heaven allows. Yeah. For, but she's, of course, taking care of Rock Hudson and he's lying there. And yeah. And she's, have, she's the nurse, and finally. And you have the deer looking in <laughs> and, the and the walking, looking in, in. walking away, which yeah. is uh, sort which, of the... Which, which, is a, which is a very, very sad ending. I it's mean, a, it's it, a totally it, sad it, It's ending. a disaster. Yeah. But it's supposed to be a happy ending, yeah. but obviously she can only be uh, his wife if she's the nurse. Of course, yeah. they're, they're not uh, engaged in any sexual activity, yeah. and nor is this couple here. And I think uh, um, uh, Min Liang, the character, is not an artist anymore. So, I mean, the troops, this sort of uh, song and dance troops of, uh, in the 90s, they stopped. I mean, they, they, there's so, s still some going on, but I mean, they're, they're less and less frequent and he's too old to be you know sort of pretending to be a break dancer from Shenzhen so probably now he's got a, a, a bureaucrat a job as a bureaucrat in, awesome. in Fenyang so mm. I think this is what the final shot means for me yeah. it's it, it's just going back to you know how life is going to be for the rest of their lives you know that's it yeah but it's definitely a great final shot. It is with the, also the kettle with the train whistle. So it yeah. starts with the train whistle, and ends again. with the kettle, and yeah. and that's the whistle of the train again. And only, you know that train that they're not on this train. It's totally domesticated. Yeah, yeah. There, the, no train is no train from, exactly. Uh, yeah, from that, from so there, there's no no train. They haven't left. Yeah. yeah. Do we have other questions? From the audience. The audience is tired. Yes, <laughs> through, sir, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the really brilliant um, um, introduction of the film. And I, I have more like maybe a comment uh, that adds in with what what we heard before, like um, especially the element of nostalgia, because I, I um, for me, it was like totally the contrary to, to nostalgia, actually, when I watched the film, especially with regard to the Me too, by the way. <laughs> especially with regard to the performing arts, because in, like in the early 2000s, I, there was like kind of nostalgia for the 80s. And I think very often if you talk about performing arts, it was really related to this experimental theatre scene and you start and the hopes and dreams that the people here have too, but that really don't work out that <laughs> way. Mm -hmm. And and this film for me really undermines many of these like um, readings of the early 2000s, of the, like the readings of the 80s that were prevalent at that time. So I really would agree <laughs> very much with your um, ambivalence that you that you mentioned. And um, also at that 
there are like a couple of comments and also references to um, performing arts apart from like just the opera, for example, when they mentioned the um, La Dame Camellia, um, which was like kind of starting the spoken drama in, in, in China as well. And so it's cleverly like interwoven in, into, into, into the film, like these little bits and pieces of fragmentary history of, of, of drama even, although you don't really see the performances, but it's, yeah. Um, so I wonder what you think about that. And then um, I, I was so reminded of, of um, Hirshang or River Elegy when I, when I watched, uh, watched the movie. I, I wonder what you have, whether you have any thoughts on, on River Elegy or Hirshang, because there's also this maritime culture uh, on the one hand, and then the land, like more like land-based culture. There's this, like the TV series that was um, on in China in the uh, 1980s and then Forbidden, which also has this um, like dichotomy that came out here a little bit with the rib um, um what's the name in english uh, uh, river, river allergy yeah. river allergy yeah, yes, river allergy. Yes. yeah so yeah. i wonder whether you see any or you you make any connection or you can relate to that as well <laughs> or comment on that thank yeah, you yeah um with, um of course river allergy had, had an enormous impact and some people link it to the tiananmen protests right and um I think being, I mean, the fact that the film at some point they go all the way to the Huanghe, to the Yellow River, to the Yellow River. There is some sort of uh, connection there. It's the Mother River, but you know they're not going anywhere. So that's that. There's that sort of um, maybe maybe I haven't really. I wrote a little bit about uh, uh, river allergy in the, in the book, but in relation to. Um, mountains may depart and because again it goes to the Yellow River and there's the Yellow River is frozen and then they, they dynamite it and but I mean it is that the river is running through his <laughs> his cinema the Yellow River and uh, all the connotations so uh, and Jajanka is from that generation that came out of you know the, the Tiananmen uh, protests and massacre and so I think um there might be a connection, although I would have to to think a little bit about this. But the ambivalence is again, you know, presence and um, and uh, the other uh, comment was about the uh, um, um, the performing arts and the and and actually he's reading a comic. I think I think Tsai Miliang's brother is reading a comic book of the uh, of uh, what do you call it in English, Dum um, Camellia. <laughs> What, what, the, uh, Camilla, La Damo Camilla. Yeah. La Damo Camilla, yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, I think, you know, again, it's those waves from outside that are com coming into the that really isolated town of Fenyang. And, and uh, it's interesting what the father says, it's a capitalist sort of reading and ah, Paris, how dare you? And then I love that scene. I think it's brilliant. And and of course that after that we have the Spanish dancing. So, you know, it's Europe sort of coming into contact with that isolated area. And it's um some people sometimes ask me, and we were talking about this just before the, the start of the lecture, why a Brazilian person would be interested in, in Judge and Kerr or what is the connection? And I mean there's you know, he's, he's appreciated in, in Brazil in university circles, obviously, and uh, of course, Walter Salles made a documentary, and there are similarities. And I think this film for me, um, while I grew up in the 80s, so I remember very well the experience of uh, things coming from outside, because Brazil was a dictatorship, but it was um, n not as closed as China, but but quite closed and we couldn't get things, we couldn't import things and even I remember American chewing gum, um, someone went to the States, I was maybe nine and they brought Wrigley's, you know, and, and my mum kept it in a box hidden and so we, we could have one a month or something and then after a few months then it just dried up so it was just horrendous and we couldn't have it anymore. So things like that, it was so precious, you know, everything coming from outside. And, and then it just opened, you know, and then we had a lot of things coming. But, uh, you know, if anyone would go and, and have, like, trainers from the U.S. or something like that, it was just incredible. So 
I think Brazilians, in a way, we we understand a lot of this, um, a, a lot of the of the events happening in, in this film. Obviously, from it's it's very different, but it's very similar at the same time. Yeah. I, I want to add a, a, a boring little note about production history. Um, once again, Takeshi Kitano shows up in the final credits. Uh, there is French money in this film. Yeah, it's the last film he sh or not the second to last film he shot he, that he didn't submit to the state censors. So it's not an official Chinese film. No, not the first uh, three. The World yeah. was the first yeah. one. Yeah. And then they sort of, re ret the Chinese government retroactively co-opted the first three films and made them official films, more or less. Yeah. Um, but this it's important to note that this film was made possible through Japanese and French producers who worked with him basically outside of the of the state film apparatus. Can you say something more about that in yeah, particular yeah. case? And I think it's, as I said, really important to mention Shozo Ichiyama, the producer, the Japanese producer, because he um, came on to work with in this film and then he became a, a sort of a steady collaborator of Jajanka. And um, I think through through Xiaowu that, you know, was shown in Berlin and uh, was became quite notorious. He already had built a, a web of uh, collaborators in Hong Kong. So his first film, Xiao Sheng, or not his first film, but one, one of his first short, medium length films, Xiao Sheng Going Home, uh, was screened in Hong Kong. And then he met Yuli Kwai and, and, and other Hong Kongers who became his producers. So he had this uh, connection with them and then with Korea. And then coming to Berlin, of course, then, you know, the connection with France was also established. And so I think it then... Ro Rotterdam, the Hubert Pauls and fund. And then Ro also Rotterdam, yeah. And then uh, with Shozo Ichiyama, um, it was really crucial for him, I think, to secure this... Japanese connection and the Japanese money and the whole Xiao Xian connection was there yeah. as well. So of course it was through Ho Xiao Xian that he ended up um with, with Shouzhou Chiama money, ended yes. up, yeah. So um it, it it's uh, interesting that he had all this um, backing from abroad from outside mm -hmm. of China, but in China he couldn't screen the film and mm -hmm. uh, and he's it hasn't been screened officially in China. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. it's one of the uh one of the regrets that he has, or one of the, the sort of, he, he, he seems to be very, very, uh, always be very upset about the fact that his first three films were not screened in China. And um, and then The World and, and Still Life and 24 City were. But mm. then A Touch of Sin, that was to be his great sort of commercial success, was censored. Mm. And that was a big blow. And then that's what you see in... Uh, the, the doc documentary about mm. Walter Salis, yeah. yeah. He almost gave up filmmaking at, filmmaking at that time, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, but I mean, you see the the, the transnational connections that sure. he's building um, through festivals and the importance of film festivals Absolutely. and the importance of working col in a collaborative form with uh, people yeah. that, you know, he, he built this web and, and it's still, it's, you know, mainly the same people working with him. Yeah. Uh, yes, Danny, again, please. Uh, did he have permission for filming from the local authorities? Because it's hard for me to conceive that he could have made that film like under the radar. Yeah, normally, uh, well, I think with um, all these three films, what happens in China is that you submit your screenplay and that goes through a first round of approvals and then you get a permission to, f to shoot. And then uh, when the film's done, shot, then it's sent again to Soft. I think it's changed name now, names now, but it's uh, the organ where they, the censorship, basically, uh, organ. And then they see the film and then they give it permission or not. So um, he had permission to shoot and the screenplay was approved. The screenplay was very different from what the film turned out to be. And then that happens a lot, you know, that you will shoot the film and then it will be censored. It happened with Touch of Sin. A Touch of Sin had been approved, so he shot with approval. He shot all over China, big production. 
and then it got, you know, sort of uh, censored. Uh, so, yeah. We Wait. learned from the film how censorship works in the rural areas of China. So Yeah. You old, can gu- old guys, old guys telling girls to dance and then <laughs> pulling their leg. <laughs> But it, it is different. I mean, if, if you think of another film that was only made possible through the Western Festival Circuit, uh, Wang Bing's West of the Tracks, mm-hmm. which was shot, shot with a portable TV camera and to this day officially doesn't exist in any way, shape, or form in China. And it was, it was basically smuggled out of the country and, and finished, uh, finished outside of China. And so what's remarkable about Zhao, despite the fact that uh, A Touch of Sin uh, was ultimately censored and that they cut some of the greatest shots out of his other films is that he somehow managed to establish a balance between the international festival uh, Fonds Sud, Hubert Balls Fond Ecology and and China. I mean, he is a, a first-rate celebrity in China now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, his uh, ambition was always to become... Uh, a popular filmmaker in this country and to contribute to filmmaking in China. He was never the kind of filmmaker like Wang Bing. You know, he's very different from Wang Bing. Uh, so that he has, a, a, he always wanted his films to be seen and to be discussed. So he's, I, I think, now reached a point in his career where he achieved that and he's happy with The Mountains Made Apart and Nash's Spirits White were films that were the circulated and people talked about quite a lot in China and he made a touch of sin with that idea and then so he's always um, he doesn't want to compromise and I'm not suggesting that he's compromised I love his uh, uh, last films and I think he's evolved as a filmmaker without compromising but he he um, but he wants to try and find a way that he can express himself as an artist and still be appreciated and seen by people in his country. So, yeah, I mean, this is something that uh, sort of runs through my book as well. I, uh, yeah. the, the, the type of artist that he is, is, is very different from someone like Wang Bing. Yeah. Or even the sixth generation directors who or are now Zhang sort Yuan. of, you know, well, it, yeah. And certainly yeah. the fifth generation directors. I mean, that, that's also something you say that in your book and, and Dai Jinhua has an essay where she talks about the singularity of of uh, in in the Chinese production system and yeah. really has managed to establish a niche for himself and yeah. maintain a degree of liberty that is quite amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. With lots of production companies yeah. that he has now, and he's become a businessman. Yeah. And people say that people from Shanxi also, also are excellent food. businessmen, yeah. and uh, so he's a proper Shanxi businessman. Yeah. That's what people in China say. And he has a restaurant. Exactly. And um, yeah, uh, but I mean, this is interesting. I remember with Tai Ming Liang, who is an artist in Taiwan. You know, very sort of. Uh, film festival sort of director with very, very difficult, like very, very long and, and um, long takes in his film. And, you know, like a Buddhist, he's all, all you know, he's that kind of um, uh, artist that you idealize and you think, you know, he's nothing to do with money. And then I remember going to Taiwan in 2010 and, and, and discovering that he opened a cafe. So he was buying cafe, coffee and, uh, and selling coffee in Taiwan and, so he was a businessman as well with uh, Li Kangsheng and Louis Qing. So it's not uncommon that uh, Chinese filmmakers will have other businesses. Well, not Chinese, but, you know, Coppola with the wine and, you know, there's this, this side businesses that <laughs> you can run. You know? I have a few other examples, but that's yeah. a different story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, but yeah, the jazz restaurant in Fenyang is um, it's, it's called Mountains Made Depart. It, it's quite nice. <laughs> okay thank you very much thank you again thank Cecilia you. this was wonderful thanks Dankeschön. for the talk Dankeschön. thank you for attending and thanks for presenting the thank you so much <laughs>